You know, I quote Jerry Clower often that it's not a shame to have head lice, it's just a shame to keep it. And I use that with ignorance. It's not a shame to be ignorant, it's just a shame to stay that way. So I'm trying to learn this microphone and, and how it all works. But it's good to be back with you guys. I was under the weather, as they say last week, so we had to, to postpone. But we're continuing tonight in our fifth and final session of accusation. Uh, accusation part five, what to do when you are accused. So we've dealt with accusation towards God, accusation toward ourself. We've looked at the difference in conviction and condemnation. Last session, we dealt with accusation towards others. So tonight, we wind the whole thing up and talk about what, what do we do when we're the one being accused? How do we handle that? How do we deal with being accused? Anybody ever been accused? Rightfully or wrongfully, <laughs> I've been accused of some things that I did. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I was guilty and I was accused. Yes, yes, I did it. But we're talking about when people accuse you wrongly. Now, I'm married. I've been married for 25 years. And my wife and I have done a lot of work in this area of understanding how the enemy works in accusation. But even after all the years of our work, that thing still creeps in from time to time. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, something as simple as, why did you fill in the blank? Can, can feel like an accusation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I feel as if I'm being accused. So whether it is outright blasphemous accusation against you that's just dead wrong, or whether it's just a miscommunication sometimes in relationship, when we feel accused, we need to understand how to process that, how to deal with that rightly, correctly, righteously. Does that make sense? So that's where we're headed tonight. We're going to jump right in with Jesus' example out of 1 Peter chapter 2. And in your notes, I've got both the King James Version and the NIV, or the Nearly Inspired Version, as some call it. You ever heard that? The Nearly Inspired? So I've got them both. I'm going to read the NIV just because it reads a little easier, but they're both there in your notes. So 1 Peter 2, 19 through 23. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, that is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to, whom, to him who judges justly. So let's look at Jesus' example. That's a pretty good place to start. Would you agree? If I want to model myself after somebody, Jesus is the one I want to model myself after. He is my Savior. He's my big brother. So the example that is given to us here of Jesus, he was, he committed no sin, verse 22. He committed no sin. So you know this about Jesus, right? He never sinned. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God except for Jesus. He was the only man who never sinned. So there was nothing that he did to justly receive any accusation. Now we've talked about in the teaching so far, we see tons of examples where the religious leaders accused Jesus, sought to capture him, catch him, trip him up in things. So they were constantly accusing him, but it was all false accusation because there's nothing that Jesus ever did that justly could be accused. This makes sense. So he committed no sin. That's not me and you. We've talked about even in our motives and understanding why we do what we do. I don't even know why I do what I do. So as we've talked about through this, there's always an element of truth in accusation. 
So even when I'm being accused and I feel like it's unjust accusation, it's possible that there's still something I've done to contribute to the accusation coming at me. Does this make sense? So very seldom is there, and it happens, but very seldom am I completely 100% justified as I'm being accused. There's an element of something that I've contributed to that I need to be able to take responsibility for. Does this make sense? Jesus never experienced that because there was no sin. He committed no sin. So every accusation against him, every insult against him was completely unfounded. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. Verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. Have you ever retaliated? That's often our defense mechanism. As soon as I'm accused, what do I want to do? I want to turn around and accuse you back. We've talked about this in this, in this series. When my wife comes at me, well, I can't believe you left that toilet lid. I told you, how many times have I told you not to leave that toilet lid down? And you left it. What do I want to do? It's jump right back at her and say, why I got to be the one to, why can't you put the seat down? Right? Why, why I got to be the one to always remember to lift the seat or to put it back down. So there's this defense that we want to get into any time we are accused. But notice when Jesus was accused, when he was insulted, he didn't retaliate. He didn't come back at them whatsoever. Hey there, prettiest girl in the house. He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Now, again, this is Jesus, and, and let's, let's very quickly go here, because people say, well, that was Jesus. I can't do that. No, 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 no. Jesus came living as a human being, empowered by the Holy Spirit to demonstrate to me and you what we can be. Do you agree with that? So if Jesus did it, if he modeled it, if he was the example of it for us, that's what we need to follow. So deal with this concept and mindset that says, I can't do that because I'm not Jesus. Jesus lives in you by his spirit. He empowers you to do what he has done. So if Jesus was able to be accused and not retaliate, if he was able to be, to be insulted and threatened, but he did not threaten back, so can we. Does this make sense? Instead, so rather than retaliating, rather than making threats, what did he do? He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Now, we're going to cover this as we move through. But what did Jesus do? He trusted his daddy, who sees all, knows all, understands all, who separates perfectly. He entrusted himself to the Father. So there's two key things that I want you to see. And we're going to talk more about how to respond correctly, but there's two key things, two key principles in the second page of your notes. He gave it to God, and he didn't open his mouth. That's how Jesus responded to the accusations that came at him. In Isaiah 53, 7, it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Matthew 27, 12, when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. So if we could just boil this down to its simplest form, how do I respond when I am accused? If I'm going to follow Jesus' example, what do I need to do? Keep my mouth shut and give it to God. Now, boy, is this hard to do. Man, it's hard to do. But, but we just dealt with the fact that we can't say, I can't do that. That was Jesus. No, I can do this. I'm being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do this. And it's just like anything else. If you don't believe you can, you never will. Right? So we've got to establish right here and right now, I am able as a son of God, as a daughter of God, that's not me, that's you ladies, as a son or daughter of God, I am capable of responding to insult, to accusation, as Jesus did. And what did he do? He kept his mouth shut and he gave it to God. Now, I'm not just teaching this out of principle and theory, okay? 
I have had the opportunity to experience some pretty severe accusations in my journey. Now, we are live streaming, so I ain't going to go into great detail. But I've had people literally accuse me of, of some pretty outlandish things. And it's not just directly to my face. I had folks literally writing. I was at one point a pastor ordained in the Free Will Baptist denomination. At this particular point, I was the, the chairman of our uh, association. I was the head of the ordaining council. I was credentialed, man. By man, it, I was right where I needed to be. And... I ain't going to get into detail, but, but I did something they weren't happy with. So they began a campaign to get rid of me. Now, if y'all know anything about me, I'm pretty stubborn. And there's something in me, when you start coming at me that way, I'm going to dig in my heels. So I dug in my heels. So it started locally spreading things about me, but that didn't end. They started writing letters. They were sending letters to the National Association of Free Will Baptists, sending letters to our state executive director, sending letters to my mama, to my wife's mama, and to my sister in Japan as a missionary. I mean, guys, this was a full-on assault against me in my character and in who I am as a man. But it wasn't real. It wasn't true. Nothing there. But boy, they acted like they had the evidence. And I I didn't know any of this stuff at the time. So I'm just praying, all right, God, what do I do? And God wouldn't let me say nothing. Keep your mouth shut, boy. Keep your mouth shut. Me and my wife would have, I mean, me and her talked about it. I guarantee you we talked about it. But but we would, I'd just say, baby, God won't let me say nothing. God won't let me say nothing. Just keep your mouth shut. Yeah, I remember saying to her during that time, The truth will come out. The truth will reveal itself. So these two principles God taught me a long time before I learned what I'm teaching you through this series. Keep your mouth shut and trust your daddy. How do you respond when you are accused? You keep your mouth shut. Don't retaliate. Don't threaten. Keep your mouth shut and entrust it to daddy. Now that's not the end of that story. I did wind up having to leave that particular church. It took me two years before those deacons finally come to me and said, hey, maybe if you'll leave, this will just all die down. So I did. I left. Went long after that I left altogether the denominational system. But I told my wife, I said, look, at some point, somehow God's going to fix all this. Some point, somehow, God's going to fix all this. Years, literally 12, 13 years later, I'm back in the same area visiting, and I've got a pastor friend of mine doing a revival service at a Free Will Baptist church. So I go to see my pastor buddy. Standing at the back door talking to him and the pastor of that church, and who walks in the door? The ring leader. Huh? I'm shocked, and so were they. To see one another there, right? And it was it was a little uncomfortable. I ain't gonna lie, it's a little uncomfortable. But we spoke, shook hands. They went on up. I didn't know this, but they were, you know, active serving in that church, playing the piano at this point. So as I always do when I go to visit, I'm sitting on the front row, right? My buddy's preaching. And right in the middle, it had nothing to do with the message whatsoever, but right in the middle of the message, he got on this thing of forgiveness, son, for about five minutes, just hammering on it. So I'm sitting there, all right, God, I'll deal with it right now if you want me to. He wouldn't let me. As is the custom in these Free Will Baptist churches that I grew up in, this particular shot seller, some of y'all might know shot, shot sellers. He, uh, he's dead and gone now, but shot at the end of that service, shot said, all right, all hearts and minds clear. So I'm like, Daddy, I'll stand up right in front of all these folks. You know I ain't scared. We'll deal with this. No, keep your mouth shut. It's not. So as is the custom in that Free Will Baptist Church, when the, when the service is over, everybody leaves the front and heads toward the back, right? Because the preacher's standing at the back door shaking everybody's hand when they come out. Everybody left but me sitting right there and her sitting on the piano. 
And God's like, all right. So I walk up. I said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm sorry for anything that I said or did to contribute. And but about as, about as much as I got out of my mouth before she started falling all over herself, I said, no, 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 I'm sorry. I was wrong. We was all wrong. And if we had been more spiritual, we could have dealt with that way back then. And we stood there for 15 minutes and hugged and cried and talked and caught up. And, and it's been, every time I've seen them since, it's been just like that. Now, it took 15 years for that reconciliation to take place. We're going to talk about forgiveness and reconciliation in the next session we're going to move into. It took 15 years for that to happen. There's a, a children's book called Mr. Peabody's Apples. Yeah, anybody ever read it? It's a great book. Very quickly, Mr. Peabody's a teacher at the elementary school. And every day, the kids watch him walk by the apple stand and grab an apple, keep walking, and eat it. So they get to telling everybody how Mr. Peabody's stealing apples. And it spreads all over until it gets back to Mr. Peabody. What they didn't know was he goes in on Monday and pays for five apples. And every day, he just grabs his apple and goes out the door. So him and the little boy had a conversation. They got straight and got right. Mr. Peabody said this, look, son, you, you got a feather pillow at home. He said, I do. He said, I want you to meet me at top of the stands at the ball field with that feather pillow. What? Yeah, just go get your feather pillow and meet me at the top of the stands at the ball field. He got up there and said, look, we got this straight, right? We're good. You understand? He said, but I want you to open that feather pillow and shake them feathers out. And you just watch the feathers spread all over everywhere. He said, every person you told... He's like, one of these little feathers is floating on the wind. Now, me and you are good. He said, but is there any way to pick up all these feathers? He said, no, Mr. Peabody, there's not. And that's such a great visual lesson for me. I don't care if I am the one being accused and it's dead wrong. If I open my mouth to defend myself, I'm going to have to accuse another to do so. Does that make sense? And when I accuse another, I'm moving out of God's kingdom and his spirit and how it operates into the enemy's kingdom and his spirit and how it operates. An accusation once released can never be stopped because it goes from me to you to you to you to you and it spreads all out. I'm here to tell you there's still people today that have a negative view of me. Because of all that transpired, although me and the ringleader are good. Does that make sense? You probably have similar stories and examples in your own life. This ex particular example is where God taught me, keep your mouth shut and trust me. Is my reputation marred? Probably. Probably always will be to some extent, in some people's eyes. Because the reality is there's always going to be somebody who would rather believe the negative about you than the positive about you. That's just reality. So how do we react or respond correctly to the accusations that come to us? Basic, as simple as I can make it, just keep your mouth shut. And entrust it all to your daddy who sees all and knows all. And he will eventually work it out. Amen? All right. So react or respond? That's the question. Would you rather react to a medication or respond to a medication? You go to the doctor. You're in the hospital. You're sick. And they give you a medication. And the doctor comes in the door and says, Mr. Griffin, you are reacting to the medication. Is that a positive or a negative? That's a negative. You don't want that. But if he comes in and says, Mr. Griffin, you are responding to the medication. Is that a positive or a negative? That's a positive. So we would rather respond than react, right? But let's just be real. How many times in life do we respond versus react? This is maturity. 
This is spiritual maturity in learning how to keep your mouth shut, listen to your daddy, talk to your daddy, and respond correctly rather than reacting. Reacting is easy. Kids react. You ain't got to teach a youngin how to react. Just take a cookie from him and watch them. They gon' react. Their, their reaction, your reaction, my reaction is almost always wrong. If we, if we can learn to stop, keep our mouth shut, pause long enough to get some dialogue going with daddy, I promise you how you react, respond to that situation is going to be different than the initial reaction that you felt. This makes sense. When we are hurt, we tend to react rather than respond. Our first reaction is always to defend ourselves and our position in the matter at hand. Do you agree? I mean, I don't care what you're accused of. Your first reaction is to defend yourself and your standing. I want to make sure you understand what really happened, right? Where do those thoughts come from? Again, all this is designed to help you take your thoughts captive, discern the sources of those thoughts. Where does that come from? Is that God giving you those initial feelings of defending yourself and your position in the matter? Is that your daddy? Is that how he's created you to think? No, that's your enemy. And that shows you just how trained we are by sin in the kingdom of sin, how deeply rooted it is in how we live our lives. Well, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It ain't lying, buddy. We got it. Now, I told you in Restored, if it came, it can leave. Sin is not you. You are not sin. Sin joined you, but just because it's here and we're familiar with it doesn't mean we need to continue to react to it. Does this make sense? Where do those thoughts come from? From your enemy. Why? Why is it that we are so quick to defend ourselves and our position in the matter? I believe it's fear of man. What I mean by that is I'm convinced that we attempt to defend ourselves because we're more concerned with what man thinks than what God knows. Come on now. Most of my life, I was ruled by this thing of fear of man. What I thought might be in your head about me ruled me. So I was much more concerned, and I believe this is true of all of us, not just me. I'm not a unicorn here. We are much more concerned with what somebody thinks about me than what God knows about me. How was Jesus able to keep his mouth shut and just entrust himself to his father? Because he was not concerned about what they thought. He was convinced of what he knew. So if we're going to reverse this thing of defending ourselves and our position in the matter, we've got to deal with this fear of man, being overly concerned with what somebody else thinks of me. When God knows the truth about me, right? In the situation I explained earlier, there were, and there was a time when God let me, there were three elements of what I was accused of that had elements of truth. And I was able to address those at at, at a point. It took took a while before God let me do it. But even in that, I look back now and I realize I was still defending myself in my position. I I I feel like God just gave me a little rope. said, all right, son, if that wore out, we'll just go ahead. If I just kept my mouth shut and trusted him, everything would have worked out better than it did anyway. Why? Because I was still more worried about what those people who were still coming to church, who were still sitting in the pews, thought about the matter than I was about what God knew about the matter. And I was more worried about how they were going to respond than I was faithful that he was going to work it out because he knows everything. This makes sense. I'm telling you, this is why I believe this need to defend ourselves is present when accusation comes at us, because I'm more worried about what you think than what he knows. we got to flip that. i got to start walking in confidence that my daddy knows me. 
He knows my heart. He knows my motives. He he knows why I did what I did. And I'm going to just trust Him to clear the mud. Let the, the mud settle so that I can see through the water again. And I promise you the truth will always reveal itself. The truth will always come out if you can just wait and trust your daddy in the process. Amen? Here's a quote by my pastor, Dr. Henry Wright. In order to defend yourself, you must accuse another. I already said that. Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend in their excellent book, Boundaries. If you've never read the book, Boundaries, put it on your list. The difference between responding and reacting is choice. When you are reacting, they are in control. When you respond, you are. Y'all see that? People say, well, he pushed my buttons. What am I saying? They are in control of how I react. You push a button all day long. If I'm in control, I'm not going to react. Does this make sense? The difference in responding and reacting has to do with choice, with control. Who's in control? Now, what is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Self-control. So this is maturity. This is spiritual maturity of learning how, even when your buttons are being pushed through accusation, to keep your mouth shut and trust God. Because I want to be in control by the Holy Spirit's control of me, not you. I've been a puppet on a string long enough by the enemy in his kingdom. I realized when I first got a hold of this understanding how much he had played me like a fiddle my entire life. And it downright ticked me off. I'm done being controlled by another kingdom. I have been given control. By the Holy Spirit of God, I get to be in control of that kingdom. I've been given power and authority over enemy, over Satan, over his emissaries. I don't have to let him push my buttons through another human being in accusation and react because you push my button. No, sir. I am the one empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to react, to respond as Jesus did. Amen? Come on, I know we might not be there yet, but we got to see the mountaintop and believe we can reach it if we're going to ever start to climb in that direction. Now, I can't tell you as I stand here in front of you, I always do this perfectly, but I see how to get there. And here's the process. Y'all with me? Five-step process to respond correctly. Number one, trust God to be your defender. Psalm 18, one through three. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Trust God to be your defender. All of these words that David, the psalmist, uses to describe God, the Lord is my strength, My rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I trust, my buckler, that's a shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. High tower is a place of safety that you run into in time of trouble. David is saying, and we need to learn to trust God to defend us. It's not my job to defend myself. It's his. I'm his boy. Right? I got three boys. And as a daddy, you mess with them, you're going to have to deal with me. I mean, that's just the reality. That's life. That's the way it's supposed to be. I am their defender. They don't have to defend themselves because I'm going to. And we've got to recognize and realize our daddy is our defender. It's not my job to defend myself. I'm supposed to keep my mouth shut and trust him to do the defending. I need to begin to identify him as David does here in Psalm 18. This is my daddy. So when the poop hits the fan, preferably, what do I do? I run to my daddy. I run to the rock. I run to the shield. I run to the high tower. I run to the one that I can depend on to trust, to defend me and take care of me. I got to go to him. 
When I defend myself, I'm taking that position that belongs to him. So the first thing we've got to do if we're going to respond correctly is learn to trust him more. Trust him to defend me. He's the defender. He's the one who can make everything right, not me. Number two, remember to rest. Now, this is founded in that restored teaching. Those first four principles, relationship, enemy, separation, thoughts. So if you haven't been here for that teaching that we went through, I can't reteach it. But, but it's, it's the, the understanding of it's all about relationship. There's an enemy that comes to cause breakdown in those relationships. I've got to learn to separate myself from that influence and learn to take my thoughts captive to discern the source of that. The more I'm able to do that, particularly here, that separation piece. Because when I'm being accused, I have to be able to stop and realize what's actually happening here. The spiritual reality of what's taking place. It's not the human being who's coming after me that is my enemy. There is a kingdom of sin in operation through that human being that's coming after me. And I have to be able to separate that person from what they're doing and make the enemy the enemy. I also have to separate what's happening inside of me that wants to react, wants to defend myself, wants to defend my position in that matter. Separation is critical to be able to respond correctly. Does this make sense? So first thing I'm going to do is take it all to daddy. i got to trust you. You're going to defend me. I've got to remember to rest, to, to separate and put into practice the principles of that restored teaching. Number three. Well, let me read my scripture. Hebrews. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. I like to think of it this way. Anytime I react rather than responding, I'm failing of the grace of God. Because hmm? I've been given grace. The empowerment of grace of God to respond correctly. So I want to do that every time. Do I do it every time? No, I still fail, but I want to. Number three, ask God to search your heart for any truth in the accusation. And this one's big. Be willing to invite God to show you what part you might have to play in what you're being accused of. Because in accusation, we've talked, there's always an element of truth. That sounded like Mitch back there. <laughs> there's always an element of truth, right? So when I'm being accused, there's going to be an element of truth. And I need, here's, here's the reality. I want, you to, I want you to hear this. This is big. This is doctorate level, all right? The accusation coming at you can be used by God to reveal to you something you might not be aware of that you can deal with and grow more mature. Huh? And, and, and just like we talked about in repentance in that restored teaching, until I recognize it, there's nothing I can do with it. Until I recognize that I can't take responsibility, I can't repent, I can't renounce and remove it. So I have to have knowledge, recognition of it. There's been times I've been accused, and I just downright didn't say, I don't see no truth in it whatsoever, God. I, I don't. But if I'm going to trust you to defend me, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, I'm going to separate people, I'm going to take it to you and say, all right, is there any truth here? That can be a scary prayer. Because when we're accused, what happens oftentimes, even when I'm trying to, to, to defend myself, it's hitting too close to home, right? They're hitting too close to something that maybe I've kept hidden. Maybe I've kept under wraps. I don't want nobody to see, nobody to know, because I still believe it's true about me. And you start getting too close to that, and it's like a dog got hit with a rock. Somebody's going to bark. So when, when accusation comes, I've got to be willing to say, all right, God, I'm getting in my underwear here. Talk to me. 
Is there any truth in this? Is there any element of truth? Is there something really going on that I don't know, that I don't see? Because if it's in here and it's not of you, I don't want it. I want to see it. I want to know it so it can be exposed so that I can begin the process of dealing with it and removing it out of my life. Right? But man, this is tough. It, it, visual image that pops in my head. It's like getting that splinter and going to daddy and him pulling out that old timer pocket knife. And I got to stand there and hold my finger while daddy's digging around to get the splinter out. That's not comfortable. I want to pull. I want to jerk. I want to say no. But if I just trust daddy, he will reveal the splinter. He will do what's necessary to get the splinter out. We all got splinters, proverbially speaking. We all got those things in our life that are true, that are going on, that need to be recognized. How are we ever going to see it if we're not willing to be honest with God and honest with ourselves and say, all right, I'm being accused of this. I don't like it. I don't think it's true. But if there is any truth here, show it to me. I'm willing to see it. David prayed that prayer in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is a powerful prayer. Search me. Search me. Know me. My heart and my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. Now, let's just be real. I I don't believe any of us can stand there and say, there's no wicked way in me. I'm sure it's all gone. (laughs) Now, (laughs) there's still some wicked ways. And the only way I'm going to grow and mature beyond my current level is to be willing to have God put his finger on and expose those wicked ways with the empowerment of his grace to learn how to deal with and remove that out of my life. But i got to be willing. Say, all right, God, search me. Show it to me. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. But show it to me. If there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Show me your way. Show me the way you want me to deal with this. Because the way I've been dealing with it ain't working too well. Show me your way. All right. So number one, trust God to be your defender. Remember to rest. Ask God to search your heart for any truth. Number four, forgive the accuser and talk to God about them. I said that just the way I wanted to. Forgive the accuser and talk to God about them. What do we normally do? Talk to everybody else about them, right? I got to forgive the accuser. Now, that's our next session. We'll get into forgiveness, bitterness and forgiveness next week. We'll start there. But I've got to begin the process after separating and making the enemy the enemy, not the person. I got to begin to pray for and forgive the person accusing me. This can be difficult to do too. But I've come to this realization. It's really hard to stay angry at somebody I'm praying for. It's really hard to stay in broken relationship, bitter, angry, unforgiveness, and resentment toward another individual if I will honestly begin to pray for them. If I can begin the process of forgiving that person. Isn't that what Jesus did? I mean, he's hanging on the cross. They done beat the hell out of him, literally hung him on a cross. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's separation. We taught that. So I've got to forgive the accuser and talk to God about them. Now I will say, as a caveat, there's a place for ministry. I don't need to be picking up the phone and calling everybody I know, telling them what they said. What they, no, 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 no. But there's a place of ministry where I can get with a trusted man or woman of God to begin to weed through what I am feeling and thinking to seek God's influence on that. So that's not what I'm talking about. Ministry is sacred. You hear me? Ministry is sacred. 
When somebody comes and sits down across the desk for me or I'm on the phone with that person, I'll tell them, look, this is a safe place. This is not a time to be super spiritual and not say anything. And feel, no, just stick your finger down your throat, throw it all up on the table so we together can weed through it and see what's actually operating here. There's a place for that in ministry. But you don't just go do that with anybody and everybody. Amen? Keep your mouth shut. Talk to God about them. And I'll be honest right here. Me and God had some pretty interesting conversations about those people in my journey. And if you don't think God can handle it, go read. Is it Psalm? Oh, heck, it ain't coming to me. What's the Psalm where David literally prays against the guy and he prays his kids are orphans and nobody feeds them? And I mean, there's a Psalm in your Bible where David just straight, he literally says, God, let his prayers be a sin. Don't even listen to him talking to you. So David is able to be honest and real about what he's feeling to God. God can handle it. I mean, if you're just that angry and that upset, tell God about it. Talk to God about them. Tell him what you're feeling, how you want to react to the situation. Get that mess up. Get it out. But do it in conversation with God. Talk to God. Forgive them and talk to God about them. Y'all with me? Matthew 5. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. These are hard scriptures. This ain't no cheap, easy believism. This is transformation by the Holy Spirit of God from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. But guys, that's what we're after, isn't it? Number five. Keep your heart open for restoration of the relationship. Keep your heart open. Took 15 years, thereabouts, but there was restoration of the relationship with that particular individual. Why? Because I kept my heart open. I told my wife all through those years, it'd come up periodically and we'd talk about it. I said, one day, one day, one day God's going to restore this. One day God's going to fix this. One day. I was just as shocked when it happened, but I believed it. I looked for it. I prayed for it. I kept my heart open for restoration. This makes sense. Romans 12, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. I love this scripture. It's not always possible to live at peace. Some people will not have peace with you. But I love how Paul says this in Romans. If it's possible, as much as lies in you. Now, my simple interpretation of that is, if there ain't no peace, make sure it ain't got nothing to do with your end. Right? We might not be at peace, but it ain't on me. I've done everything I know to do to make peace, to, to be at peace. I want to make sure as much as lies in me, I'm pursuing peace. I'm pursuing reconciliation of that relationship. So if we're not at peace, it ain't going to be on me. I'm not going to stand before God accountable for a lack of peace in our relationship. It's going to be on you because I'm going to pursue peace. That's what I hear Paul saying here. As much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. Do not retaliate, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. So God's going to deal with it. We might not be necessarily happy with the way God deals with it, especially if we haven't forgiven yet. How do you know if you've really forgiven somebody who has accused you and done you wrong when they're blessed and you ain't ticked about it? Huh? When they are receiving favor, when they are receiving blessing, and I'm not upset about it, that reveals to me that I've really forgiven that person. I'm praying for their blessing. I'm praying for God to move in their life in a positive way. Many times, God does things differently than we would do. Have you noticed that? Vengeance is mine. 
Now, I used to read that and say, well, that means God's going to just beat their tail one day, and I can't wait till that day comes. Come on, God, get them. God's not operating in bitterness and unforgiveness. We are. God separates perfectly. God understands perfectly how that individual needs to be treated about that issue. He's going to give them the same grace and the same mercy that he's given me every time I've failed. That's how God shows vengeance. Amen? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's my son. That's my daughter. You let me deal with them. Right? As a a, a father... It's amazing to me how much my boys have opinions about how I ought to treat the other ones. And how many times, I mean, seriously, almost every day I've got to say, look, let me be daddy. Let me be the daddy. It ain't your job to to parent your brother. It's mine. Let me be the daddy. And that's what I hear daddy saying here. Y'all got in a little squabble. Now let me handle it. Let me be the daddy. I will repay. I'll make sure that one gets what they need for the way they've dealt with you in this situation. But I promise you, what they need isn't what the enemy's telling you you want to give them. So when God moves in their heart and life and begins to shower them with blessings and favor, and it just riles me on the inside, that's a sure sign I've not forgiven I've not released. I've not let God be God. Now I'm mad at God because he's blessing them. Come on, let's just be real. You've been there. Don't tell me you hadn't. Upset at God because God's not giving the vengeance that I want him to give to those people who mistreated me. Let God be daddy. Y'all still with me? I made you mad yet. Vengeance is mine. I'll repay. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So I used to read this and think that, that, that sounds like exactly what they need. Coals of fire heaped on their head. I can't wait to see that day come. Get them, God. But I read a commentary one day that messed me up. In that culture, fire was very important. Without fire, you ain't got nothing. So what what this is referring to, according to this commentary, and I don't know if it's valid or not, but it's really good, is if your neighbor comes to you and his fire's gone out, and he needs a coal to start another fire at his house, you heap coals of fire upon his head. Now what's the deal with the head? In that Middle Eastern culture, where do they carry things? On their head. So he's literally saying whatever they need. If he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he needs fire, you make sure he's got enough to get home and have plenty when he gets there. This is the heart of our Father. Even towards those who have mistreated him and have mistreated us. Feed him. Give him what he needs. In doing, you'll be heaping coals of fire on his head. You will be showing the nature and the character of your father. Remember, it is the goodness, the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. So is it possible that the reason why we don't have peace, the reason why we don't have reconciliation, is I'm not allowing God to use me to bring his spirit to bear on you because of what I think you have done to me. I'm not loving you. I'm not forgiving you. I'm not feeding you. I'm not giving you water. I'm not heaping coals of fire on your head because I'm still in bitterness. I'm still in unforgiveness. I'm still in resentment, and I'm pissed. And I'm praying all the time that God will get you. Huh? Is that reacting or responding? We're talking about how to respond correctly. First thing I do is trust my daddy to be my defender. Remember to rest. Separate. Take your thoughts captive. Ask God to search your heart for any truth in what you're being accused of. Forgive the accuser. Talk to God about them. Keep your heart open for reconciliation of the matter. That's how we respond correctly. Now, I guess it ain't easy. If it was easy, everybody do it, right? If you do this, you're going to be different. You'll be different. And it is that difference 
that begins to allow the Spirit of God to operate through you in people's lives. Does that make sense? Are you, are you tracking with me here? When I'm able to be different, when I'm able to have God's Spirit operating in me in circumstances and situations where everybody else is going to do it different, what is that? It brings glory and honor to God. He is revealed. He is exposed. And somebody's going to come ask you, man, how in the world are you able to act like this? When that, if that person did me that way, I'd have done jacked his jaws. And, and you're doing this. I promise you it's going to give you opportunity to share with others how the grace of God has transformed your heart in life. It's going to be used of God for His glory. If you can be different than everybody else. Amen? Paul's example. We're almost done. We're going to get out of here by eight, maybe. 2 Timothy 4. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. All right, so Paul's saying, hey, this is what happened. He, he, he mistreated me bad. The Lord reward him according to his work. What is Paul saying? I give it to God. I'm going to let God handle that. I'm going to let God deal with that situation. Of whom be thou where also. So that there's nothing wrong with telling somebody else, look, this is what happened. And you need to be aware that this is possible in your relationship with them too. But I better have my heart in forgiveness before I start having that conversation. Right? Of him be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So he, he's, he's, he's a problem. He's causing issues. Now I'm trusting God to handle it, but I want you to be aware of the situation. At first, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. So when Alexander the coppersmith came at Paul and, and he was trying to respond correctly to the situation, what happened? Everybody split. Now let's just be honest. Many times when you're accused, there's going to be a whole lot more people believe what you're accused of. And they'll leave you. And Paul said, everybody left me. I'm right by myself. At my first answer, once the, the news broke, everybody left me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Huh? Do you see the Spirit of God in operation here? Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Everybody left. But that's all right. Because God didn't leave. The Lord stood with me and he strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So Alexander the coppersmith stirred up some trouble that could have, should have got Paul killed and everybody bailed on him. He's right by himself. That's all right. He said, God's with me. And he strengthened me. Even in those circumstances, Paul didn't keep his mouth shut in regards to preaching the gospel. He preached the gospel. And God delivered me from that circumstance and situation. Now, he calls it the mouth of the lion. Now, different commentators say different things. This could be just a you know, proverbial way of saying God delivered me from this situation. Or it could literally be like Daniel in the lion's den. That Paul was thrown to the lions and God delivered him. It doesn't matter. Either way, the point is this. Paul was accused. Everybody bailed on him. But how did he react or respond? He responded. He trusted God. He forgave. You read it right there. Don't let it be laid to their account. I'm not, I'm not blaming them. I'm not accusing them. God was with me. That's all I need. God will get me through. He delivered me. He got me through that situation. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So what's Paul saying? This ain't the last time this kind of stuff's going to happen. Can I, can I give you the news? 
The accusations you faced in your life, the issues that you've had to deal with in the past, it ain't over. It's coming again. You're going to have to deal with something again. And it may be public. It may be large. It may be serious issue. I mean, I, I got some stories rolling in my head that I can't share because of confidentiality of people and what they've had to go through and deal with in life. Public humiliation, public disgrace. It's going to happen. It's coming again. You ain't through it, right? The Bible's pretty clear. The more you begin to truly identify and walk with God, the more righteous you are, the more persecution's going to come at you. So don't think we are avoiding issues. The more like God we get, the more issues we're going to have. Now, that may not build the church, but it'll build a Christian. Amen? It's coming. Paul said, look, he delivered me from this situation, and I'm telling you what, he's going to deliver me from every other one that's coming because I know how to respond correctly. I know how to trust my daddy to be my defender. I know how to rest. I know how to do this the way God has taught me to do this, and he will get me through. Is it fun? No. So in conclusion, four minutes. Often those who make false accusations are not concerned about the truth, nor do they have your best interests at heart. You've probably experienced this when you've been accused. And you try to defend yourself. You try to, no, this is not what, no, that's not the way it was. Let me tell you what, they don't care. They're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in what really happened. I mean, that's just the case. Often those who make false accusations against you, they're not concerned about the truth. They don't have your best interests at heart. They're not trying to be in relationship. They're out to get you. They're out to hurt you. That's just reality. Separate them. Recognize that's the enemy in them. They're ignorant. They don't know it. Father, forgive them. They don't understand. But recognize it's going to happen. So you can't defend yourself against that. You can't bring enough truth against that to logically resolve the situation. It's not going to happen because we're dealing with a spiritual kingdom at work. Second, there will always be those who will be more eager to believe something negative about you than to believe something positive about you. It's just true. The word on the street. Negative sales. That's why you flip on the news and they ain't talking about a bunch of good stuff. They talking about all the bad stuff. Why? Two minutes. Somehow I caught this other day on Netflix while I was laid up, not feeling good. There was a show about him, and I don't even remember the guy's name. He was from Hawaii. He played with uh, Notre Dame, was one of the top defensive backs, and, and he had a a girlfriend that died. Did y'all remember this? Years ago, it was all over news in ESPN and everything else. Come to find out, it would, it was, she was catfished the whole time. There was no girlfriend. There, there it was a dude acting like a girl, and it was a mess, and it just blew up his life. I mean, he was set and primed to be one of the highest picked people in the first round of the NFL, and it all broke right before that went down. Just ruined his life. And it was a documentary about how all that unfolded and what all actually happened, and it was really pretty interesting because it fits right into what we're talking about right now. I mean, he, he'll never get that back. I mean, it's, it's, it's completely ruined the world's view of who he is. But none of it was true. He had nothing to do with any of it. There will always be more people willing to believe the negative about you than there is to believe the positive about you. And like it or not, that is a good thing. Because it reveals who your crew is. It reveals those people that you can trust. It reveals those people you can go to war with. When you go through times like this and those who stick with you, those who are there to support you, 
in every pastor in the Free Will Baptist denomination. There's probably not a chance any of them listening tonight. But, but there was two out of the whole state of Georgia that called me and said, look, I don't want to talk about none of it. I just want to let you know I love you and I'm praying for you. That was one. The other one showed up at my door. I said, hey, well, I can't tell you exactly what he said. But he said, look, don't worry about it. I love you. Two people. Out of all these pastors that I rubbed shoulders with, out of all these pastors that, that we went on retreats and played golf and everything else together, two said, I don't care. I ain't even interested. Don't tell me nothing. All I want you to know is I love you, and I'm praying for you, and I'm here for you. Call me anytime. It reveals your crew. You might be surprised by who your crew is. You may be surprised by those who stand with you when everybody else bails against you. But boy, when you find your crew, you found something worth something. We're going to be out by eight, and we all, almost are. The best thing you can do is give the matter to God, ask Him for the truth to come out, and for His will to be done. That's it. Keep your mouth shut. Trust it with your daddy. That's how we deal with accusation. Father, we love you. We thank you for our time together tonight. Bless us, and thank you for that one extra minute that we went over tonight. Next week, we'll be back. We'll cover, uh, we'll start with bitterness. Bitterness. It's going to be fun. This is one of my favorite, te- I love accusation, but I love bitterness too. It's going to be one of my favorite. So we're going to start next week with what I call the progression of bitterness. The, the, the methods, the tricks, the strategies, how the enemy works to get you into full-blown bitterness. There's a progression. Unforgiveness, resentment, retaliation, anger, hatred, violence, and murder. We'll cover all that next week, and then we'll move along. I think there's four sessions of bitterness. So, got a lot more to go. Y'all enjoying? I'm having fun, whether y'all are or not. Amen? All right, we'll see y'all next week. Thank you. Bye.